Ah, uh, the sweet sounds of Aaron Thompson's guitar. <laughs> it makes everything I say sound more spiritual, so. Just keep playing. Oh, where'd he go? <laughs> the title of my message this morning is Please Confirm Your ID. Any of the rest of you spend hours over this Christmas trying to get past this screen, downloading a new app or music for your kids or whatever? How many times you have to punch in your code and confirm your ID? It's a part of the world that we live in today, and it's part of what I want to talk to you about this morning based on what Paul says here in Galatians chapter 5. I figure it's a good time to talk about identity because of the fact that we're at the end of one year heading into a new year. And this is often a time where people naturally consider and reflect on who we are in relationship to who we want to be or who we want to become. And so for a lot of us, that takes on the form of resolutions that we're going to make heading into this new year to lose weight or gain momentum or reach goals or whatever it is. How many of you are New Year's resolution kind of people? How many of you set resolutions? Wow, not very many. You guys just are happy with the way you are, huh? It's all good. <laughs> Why would I want to change this? I mean, <laughs> I have resolutions, by the way, but I'm not going to share them with you. It's interesting because every sense of identity comes with its own accompanying set of characteristics. So whatever identity we take on for ourselves, it, it tends to affect literally every area of our lives. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but depending on what you're wanting to identify with, it affects the way you dress, it affects the way you talk, it affects the things you're interested in. It affects every area of your life. Let's just do a little experiment and we'll see if you can sort of picture the way that these different kinds of identities affect every area of our life. If I say surfer, what do you think of in your mind in terms of identity? How they dress, how they talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> All right, let's see if we have this one. If I say gangster, <laughs> got any gangsters? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Nate Ariano, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> this wasn't planned, by the way. I don't know what these guys, <laughs> safety team. I'm kind of scared to do the rest of what's on my list. You, know, you see what I'm getting at, though? The way we talk, the way we dress. And it's interesting when you watch people take these things, like surfing, artist, musician, things that you do, and you take that pursuit out to the level of not just something that you do, but it actually becomes a part of who, who you are, a sense of identity that we find in these things. And we live in a unique time where we're constantly being asked to confirm our identity, not just um, in our families or in our community or in society, but because so much of our life now is lived electronically. And so there such a thing as identity theft in the days that we're living in. And that's why there's this constant confirmation of who are you? Is it really you? Punch in your unique characters to prove that you really are you. And in a way, we could say that what Paul's writing here is sort of the first century equivalent to this pop-up screen that so many of us are familiar with. He's, he's urging and exhorting the Galatians to confirm their identity because 
They're in what we would say today a bit of an identity crisis. Certain false teachers have come in and confused the Galatians about who they are. And so Paul is writing to remind them about their identity in Christ. He's urging them to confirm that identity and reminding them that there are certain unique characteristics that appear in the life of a Christian. He calls it the fruit of the Spirit that comes from the life of the man or the woman that is truly planted in Christ. The characteristics that we begin to take on, the way that we talk the way that we act, the way that we walk, the things that we're interested in and even desire, all because we're pursuing a life in Jesus Christ. And so what I want to do is look at this identity crisis that the Galatians are having, what, what happened and how Paul writes to them. And then I want to look at some of the identity characteristics that Paul describes here for the true Christian. That'll be our simple outline for this morning. By the way, uh, if you're looking for a definition of identity crisis, here's what it is. It's a period of uncertainty and confusion in which a person's sense of identity becomes insecure, typically due to a change in their expected aims or role in society. That's what an identity crisis is. And what Paul sees is how the false teachers have crept into the midst of the believers in Galatia. And again, they've confused them about who they are. They've confused and led them astray from the truth. They they came in and said to these believers who were brand new in their faith, hey, you have to actually become Jewish to be a Christian. Talk about an identity crisis for these people who were not Jewish by origin. And yet people had come down from Jerusalem and said, you have to now become familiar with our customs and bring yourself under our laws to the, even the extent that you have to be circumcised because that's one of our traditions under the old covenant. And so... The Galatian believers are all confused and it's, it's leading to them being led away from the freedom that they have in Christ. And one of the things that I want to point out just before we go any further is, isn't that how it always is? It really seems to be, and I think this is an important principle, that it's, it's people that we pursue that end up having one of the greatest impacts on our own personal identity. It's been said this way, show me the five people who you spend the most time with and I'll show you who you are. Because, hmm, (laughs) it's, it's true, isn't it? Is there anything that has more of an impact on our lives than who we spend time with? And so in Paul's absence, from this church that he had planted and cared so much about, others had come in, and because of the amount of the time and the influence that they had over the Galatians, it was creating this identity crisis. I remember growing up, my parents used to always say, look, you'll have so much more freedom and basically be able to do whatever you want to do depending on who you choose to hang out with. If you're in with the wrong crowds and the wrong kinds of people, guaranteed you'll be home in bed every night at 8 o'clock at night. But if you're hanging with good people in a good crowd, then you'll experience a lot more freedom. The Galatians were experiencing less and less freedom because of who they were with. It had really begun to impact their identity, because they were imitating and being influenced by these false teachers. And and I'm not so sure that things are very different today. In fact, I think things that are, the way we are experiencing them are are quite similar. I think that in in a similar way, maybe for different reasons and under different kinds of uh, 
circumstances, but I, I think some would say the church of today is experiencing something of an identity crisis, a period of confusion and uncertainty and insecurity even. Why? Do you remember the definition? It has to do with when our role or our aims in society change. And I think that's really true of the church. The church used to have a more central place in society. The church used to be a respected part of society, but it seems like those days are either entirely gone or they're almost all the way gone. There's not that kind of respect for the church's place in the midst of society. And so we're living in days where there's a lot of people that are trying to redefine what the church is and what we should be doing. And, and there's, there's a lot of insecurity and there's a lot of uncertainty. And I think ultimately what it's created for many in the church and for the church as a whole is an identity crisis. Maybe somewhat similar to what the Galatians were experiencing in Paul's day as he's writing to them. And, and of course, these are times when, when we're ripe for false teachers to come in and to begin to answer the questions and to lead many astray. And that's what they were experiencing in Paul's day. And so Paul's words and his encouragements here, I think, are very appropriate for us too. Even as we ask ourselves, where are we? at the end of 2018 and now the beginning of 2019. It's interesting, I was reading about identity crisis because it was the title and playing into this part of my sermon and there was a guy by the name of Eric Erickson who is actually credited with coining that phrase that we use very commonly today. And here's what he had to say. He said, an identity crisis occurs in that period of the life cycle when each youth must forge for himself some central perspective and direction, some working unity out of the effective remnants of his childhood and the hopes of his anticipated adulthood. Now, I'm not going to bore you with everything this guy said, but he actually spent his life studying this subject and came up with this idea that there's actually eight phases of identity crisis through an individual person's life. And I just want to mention really briefly the last four for our consideration this morning because I think there may be some very pointed application in what he observed. But the last four go like this, verses, or excuse me, ages 12 through 20. If you're 12 years old or 20, raise your hand. All right, a few of you. He said this is the time of an identity crisis of identity versus confusion. You're trying to figure out who you are and who you want to be coming. How about ages 20 through 35? Anybody 20 through 35 here? He said that's a whole nother period, an opportunity for identity crisis of intimacy versus isolation. Isn't that interesting? You get a little further into life and you experience a little more and what you discover is that life and relationships are more challenging than maybe you thought. And it can create a crisis. Am I gonna continue to open myself up and pursue intimacy or am I gonna begin to isolate and hide myself away? But about the age 35 through 65, who's in that category? It almost seems like the majority this morning. It's the biggest age range, but he says this is a period of identity crisis where we're determining productivity versus stagnation. And the determining factor, Erickson said, I thought this was interesting, is whether or not we find someone, whether our children or other people in our life, that we can pass on our wisdom to, what we have learned and gained in the course of our life. If we can find people to pour into then we become more and more productive, or in biblical words, fruitful. If we don't, then we begin to stagnate. And then 65 plus, anybody in that range? Awesome. Integrity 
versus despair? Will we continue to walk in that hope and in that faith that we have had all our lives or through the end of life and through that final phase will we begin to be discouraged? It's funny because I think oftentimes it's people in that stage of life at least that I've experienced that begin to look at the good old days and begin to complain about kids these days and how things are, right? It's just kind of a natural thing in life. But I think it can be a time of identity crisis. Are we going to look forward in faith and see what God's doing in the present and walk in the integrity of our faith, believing that God will be faithful through it all, or will we begin to despair Interesting, Erickson's observations, this idea, and here's really the point of all that, okay? You say, why would you go through all that? Because what it speaks to me, and again, this is a man who spent his life studying these things, is that every single one of us potentially is in a season of life where there's an opportunity for identity crisis. It's not just in your teenage years or when you're a kid or when you retire or empty nest or whatever. We, we see kind of those natural points where, where you have those moments, but, but really every age and every stage and every season of life is bringing about changes and challenges that can result in, in a crisis, a question. Who am I? And where am I with who I am in relationship to where I want to be and and who I want to become? We're searching for this perspective. And the way that Erickson says it is we're, we're wanting to forge an identity from our past and hold on to the hopes for our future. We're constantly reevaluating in every season of life. But here's the good news. Here's why all this is so interesting to me, especially in relationship to what Paul is writing to the Galatians. The good news is, on the verge of this upcoming new year, and as the previous one comes to a close, you and I don't have to forge this identity alone. We don't have to come up with this perspective on our own. We don't have to reinvent ourselves or or come up with some incredible perspective because the good news is that our identity has been forged for us in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. See, this is the mistake I think that we make in the current climate of things where our role as the church is being reevaluated in society. We're told your faith is something, you know, just sort of private and personal that you just kind of keep to yourself over in this religious corner of your life. But Paul would say, no way. As Christians, This is our identity. We have this incredible freedom that we've been given because we've taken on the name of Jesus to ourselves. And it's supposed to shape every aspect, every area, and every element of who we are. Our identity has been forged for us in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Do you remember what Paul said to the Galatians in Galatians 2, chapter uh, chapter 2 and verse 20? He says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If that statement isn't a statement about a sense of identity for the Christian, I don't know what is. It's no longer I who live. I'm not trying to find myself and reinvent myself and forge some new identity for myself. It's been given to me. It's been done for me. I've been crucified with Christ. And yet I didn't die, I'm I'm living because the life that I now live, I live by faith and it's him who lives in me. What an incredible sense 
of identity that we have as Christians in Christ. Howard G. Hendricks said it this way. He said, there was no identity crisis in the life of Jesus Christ. He knew who he was. He knew where he had come from and why he was here. And he knew where he was going. And when you are liberated like this, then you can serve. I love that because that's our identity in Christ, Christian. We know who we are because we know who we belong to. We know where we have come from. To put it in the language of Paul's letter to the Galatians, born of the Spirit, begun in the Spirit. We know where we're from. We know why we're here. To walk by the Spirit, Paul says in verse 16 that we read this morning. To love and to serve because faith works through love. And the life of the Spirit is a life of serving and loving others. We know why we're here. We've been given a purpose. We have a mission. We know where we're going. Paul says in Galatians 5 verse 18 that we read this morning, we're led by the Spirit. We're not having to figure it out on our own because we have his Holy Spirit to lead us. And so we've taken on the name of Christ, a whole new identity with its own accompanying set of characteristics. Isn't it good news today to be reminded that we don't have to find ourselves or figure out who we're going to be in this new year or reinvent ourselves? Whatever slight adjustments or tweaks we want to make, fine. But we have a rock-solid identity in Jesus Christ because of what he's done for us. And again, every identity should and does come with its own accompanying set of characteristics. And this, this is true for the Christian too. Really, this is the heart of what Paul's writing about here in this part of his letter. When he begins to describe the difference between our old life our old identity that was defined by the flesh and the desires of the flesh and all that that resulted in, it was nothing good. And Paul says, that's who we used to be. That was our old identity. That was the life that we formerly lived that now we've forsaken. And now we have this new identity in Christ and it's the life of the Spirit. Well, what are the characteristics of the life of the Spirit? These are familiar words, but look at them again with me in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, the, the fruit coming from the life of the man or the woman whose identity is firmly planted in Christ is love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. I think that this would be a wonderful exercise for us on the verge of this new year. And as we wrap up the one previous, to ask ourselves and to say, how much of this fruit Am I seeing in my life at this time? Because these are really evident things. They're not hard to spot. They're not hard to see or observe when they appear in the life of a man or a woman. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. They're evident. But are these a part more and more of your life? Are these a part of our identity? What characterizes us as followers of Christ? Are these the things that are more and more abundantly seen in our lives? That should be our desire. More of your spirit, Lord. More of a sense of our identity that comes from the finished work of Christ who's living in me, more of the fruit. 
of these things in my everyday life. I don't know how many of you had the opportunity to hear the message that my wife gave uh, to the women earlier in the month at their Christmas party, but it was phenomenal. Yeah, so I'm going to quote the uh, Reverend Kara Vesnes this morning <laughs> because it was, I'm still chewing on it. If you haven't heard it, I would highly recommend you go into our app. It's there for free. You can find it and listen to it because she was talking about labels and really it's very much along the lines of what I'm wanting to express to you this morning, this sense of identity, how we label ourselves. And the world holds out all of these things and we get stuck with all these things from our past and and this is where we're trying to gain this perspective and see who we really are and And Kara talked about the the communicable attributes of God. Now, you may say, well, what does that mean? It just simply means that there are some of God's attributes, some of who God is, that is transferable to us. Now, some of God's attributes are not. We're never going to be omniscient. We're never going to be omnipotent. Uh, Those aren't attributes that we'll ever have. But some of God's attributes are absolutely able to, to be worked into our lives. And these are some of them, some of the key ones, the fruits of the Spirit. Because these are all things that God himself is. These are his characteristics. God is love. Doesn't the Bible tell us that? He is the source of all true joy. He is the prince of peace. God is patient and kind and good and faithful and gentle and perfect perfectly in control. And what I like about this thought and and what was so powerful to me with what Kara shared with you women was that a lot of times when we think of our identity, we say things as Christians like, well, we're forgiven or we're accepted or, you know, these are the labels that we want to exchange for the old things. And, And those are absolutely true. Those are true of us. Those are things that God has done for us. But isn't it incredible to think that God wants to work his very character into our lives in this way by his Holy Spirit? So that the identity that we have wouldn't just be that we walk around saying, well, I'm, a, I'm forgiven, which is wonderful and awesome. But it really doesn't define who I am moving forward. It more covers my past, my shortcomings, my failure. But, but who do I want to be in day-to-day life? I want to be kind. I want to be faithful, not just forgiven. I want to be good. <laughs> I want to be patient. I want to have joy and, and peace. And I love this thought because through His Holy Spirit, Paul, is writing to the Galatians, this is your identity. This is who you are and who you are becoming because you have God's own spirit living in you. And one of the things that I want to emphasize this morning is when we look at this list, of the fruits of the Spirit, and when we evaluate how much of this fruit is in our lives. One of the things that I want to encourage us in is that we should not say to ourselves, even when life is difficulty, we want to see these things. We should say to ourselves, especially when life is difficult, these are the things that we want to see God producing in our lives. Why do I say that? Because some of us may look back at the former year and and see less of this fruit than we might want. (laughs) Well, I wish there there was more of this fruit in my life in 2018 than I see. And we may be tempted to go down the road or down the lines of thinking, well, there would have been more fruit if this didn't happen to me and if this person didn't do that to me. And, and if these circumstances wouldn't have come about, there, there would have been, see, there would have been more of this fruit if, if life was easier, had worked out better, or more along the lines of the way I wanted it to. But the real challenge, this is, this is the real challenge, I think, for us looking forward 
to the life that we want, our identity, walking in what we've been given in Christ is not just even when life's hard, but especially, especially when we're going through the trial, when we're in the storm, when we're in the midst of the challenges and temptations of life, especially during those times is when we want to see this fruit in our lives. Amen? Because that is going to be the greatest witness to the glory of God. If our lives are easy and blessed, we can thank God for that, but no one's going to look at our lives during those seasons and times and say, oh, you're patient and kind, good for you, wonderful, it's easy for you. But what about in the time of your trial? What about in the time of your testing? Is there still something of the evidence of the fruit of his spirit, the patience and kindness and goodness and joy and peace that can be seen in your life? That's what God wants to do. That's the identity that he's given to us. I guess what I'm saying is I, I see far too many times in my own life and I see far too many Christians that are pointing to their circumstances and using them as an excuse for why these things can't be seen in their life. When those are the very times when they should be the most evident of the power and the grace of God at work in us. So if 2018 has been filled with challenges and trials for you, and if looking ahead at 2019, you see more of the same up ahead. Don't disqualify yourself from this encouragement and this challenge. But instead, ask that God would fill you with more of his spirit so that you would not be operating in the flesh, in your own strength, because we all know what that produces, but instead that we would live by the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. These are all things that Paul encourages us to do in this passage so that the fruit of his Spirit might be produced more and more abundantly in us. Our identity is in the one who created us, forever bound up. And so no matter how much effort we may try to put into reinventing ourselves, we're never going to get away from this. And sometimes, sometimes I think of how exhausted people are from suppressing this reality. You were created by him, and you were created for him. And you'll never truly be happy. You will never know true joy and satisfaction until you live in line with your true identity, what you've been created for, a relationship with him. The way that Paul says it to the Galatians, children of God, fully adopted sons and daughters with every privilege and inheritance that's been given to us, not slaves, not those who are under the law, not those who have to try to earn and work to deserve his favor. But God has so lavished his love upon us that we can come to him and that we can receive even his own spirit to begin to walk in and to grow into who we are becoming and who he has promised we will be. And so here's my encouragement as we close. When you're caught between who you are and who you want to become, it doesn't have to be a crisis with Christ because you have the assurance, you have the assurance in this coming year that he will see you through. He will get us there. He will accomplish his good will in us. His 
promises will bring to us the perspective concerning our past and remind us of the certainty of our hope with regard to the future because he is the author and he is the finisher. He who started a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. This is our identity, Christians. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.